Welcome everyone. It's great that you could be here tonight. I uh, just want to let you know this is our first time using the webinar tool on uh, Zoom. So if it goes a bit pear-shaped, please bear with us. Um, I've not done a webinar before, but we had so many people coming that we had to do something different to be able to fit you all in. Um, and that's really important that you could all be here. Um, what we're going to talk to about tonight is general in nature and not specific advice. And it's just a conglomeration of um, 25 years of doing therapy and working with families. I am not saying I'm the world expert on this. I'm just saying here's some learning that we've done as a team and we would really like to share that with you. Um, we thought that there might be um, maybe 20 people. So when we had 136 people register, we were flabbergasted. And so we're excited that you could be here. So let's get started, shall we? So what is task and demand avoidance? So it's where kids or young people put more energy into avoiding what you've asked them to do than what it would take to do the task. So it might be that you've asked them to get up and go and put their plate on the sink um, and they argue about it, they talk about it, they bring up another topic that they want to discuss with you, they um, have a meltdown, they explain to you the hundreds of reasons why they shouldn't go and do it, why they did it yesterday, why you should do it, why their little brother or sister should do it before they do it because they were first yesterday. Um, and they can just keep going on and on and on and on about why they shouldn't do it. And it could result in an hour or two's meltdown and that's just crazy. So that's the extreme end of things. Now, then we just have the normal task and demand avoidance and refusal that your garden variety average kid does. Now, tonight I'm going to talk a whole lot about demand avoidance. And then at the end, I'm going to give you some strategies to use straight away. So the first part of tonight, I'm going to be running through some slides and giving you some information. We will be putting the slides on the website as well, and we'll let you know when they go up. Um, and then at the end, we'll have question and answer time for about 20 minutes. So if you can please type your questions into the question box. Um, or into the chat, Karen, um, my amazing clinical lead, um, who's here with us tonight, is taking notes. And what she will do is she will actually ask me your questions um, because possibly a lot of them will be really similar and we can lump and theme them. Um, the other thing I'm interested to know is other topics that you would like more training and more learning about. Our intention is to do one of these on the first Thursday night of every month. So it won't always be this topic, but we'll do something that you have said you would like more information about. So when task and demand avoidance becomes extreme, we're actually looking at a disorder called PDA. Oh. Right. I'll get this worked out, I promise. Yep, yeah, that's it. So there's the normal age appropriate stuff and then there's the extremes. So we often see these extremes of demand, demand avoidance in our alphabet kids. So our ADHD, our ODD, our ASD, um, our chromosome disorders, um, all of those specific learning disorders, sensory processing disorders, um, a lot of the disorders and syndromes, we really see this demand avoidant nature come through. Um, one of the issues is that all of these disorders are kind of categorised in the DSM-5. Often we've got kids that actually don't fit any of those profiles correctly. And what happened was in the UK, um, a wonderful woman did a whole lot of research and she came up with and realised that there was a subset of autism called pathological demand avoidance syndrome. Now in the UK, it is a standalone recognised diagnosis. It is not here in Australia and I don't actually ever expect it will be. 
But what I'm finding is that a lot of doctors and psychologists are happy to have it as autism spectrum disorder with a pathological demand avoidance profile. So it, it sits alongside. So the primary diagnosis from their perspective is the ASD, and then we can have the pathological demand avoidance syndrome. Now, um, the research in the UK shows you can, that you can have PDA without an autism diagnosis that is not accepted in Australia at all. So let's have a look at what PDA is. So it's a pervasive developmental disorder. So it affects every area of life. So it has some of the same characteristics as autism. So you'll find that there is a, often a speech and language or communication delay. Often their expressive language is amazing. They can, you know, great bush lawyers, argue like crazy, can turn you around in circles really, really quickly um, and leave you tied up in knots while they seem to be quite okay about it. Um, but their receptive language, so what comes in, they don't always understand everything they hear. And that's often because they're so anxious and tied up in knots themselves. And their pragmatic language skills can be really, really delayed. So pragmatic language is the understanding of reciprocal communication, so backwards and forwards communication, all of the social norms and rules, the rules of the playground, the rules of the classroom, not understanding hidden curriculum. So by hidden curriculum, I mean those hidden rules of the classroom. You know, when the teacher says, okay guys, and everybody just gets up from their chair and they come and sit down on the mat. The teacher actually didn't say, come and sit on the mat guys. She just said, okay guys, they won't understand that. And then they'll get into trouble for not coming and sitting down. I said to you, Bobby, come and sit on the mat. No, you didn't. You just said, okay, guys, you did not say come and sit on the mat. And then they can get very railway tracked and anxious about that. And they experience that as a demand on them that they can't do and that they can't meet. They have some characteristics that are very different to your classic autism diagnoses. In public, they can be really social and really competent, especially if they have a role that they're playing. Whether it is an imagined role that they have inside, whether it's the way they wear their hair or clothes that they wear, whether it's a task or a job, real or perceived, that they think they have in this space. And even if that's just being a good student, that can be a role that they take on um, and then they can operate quite successfully at school in that space for a long period of time. However, as you would be aware, I'm sure, the energy that it takes to maintain that role is absolutely exhausting because they're crazy hypervigilant and just trying to manage everything and keep an eye on everything that's going on. As soon as they hit the car, they're melting down. Often it can be really, really challenging behaviour, aggressive, um, rude, even violent. Excuse me. Let's have a look and see what we've got on the next slide. They often have great difficulty getting along with other children. They really struggle to um, tune in to what's happening in the space and to be really appropriate and sensitive. They can often be really quite bossy um, and they can play very rough because they don't have a good sense of the impact of their behaviour on others. They can be quite obsessional um, and it might not be kind of a traditional autism obsession. Often with kids with PDA, their obsession is avoiding demands. And it's tricky because we don't always understand what demands are for them. So demands can be um, just simply getting out of bed in the morning, 
getting dressed. They can be um, internal demands that they place on themselves. I you know several kids that have tasks that they feel that they need to do every day. And if they don't feel like they've got the energy on the inside to do the demands that are self-imposed, they can't get out of bed and they can't function. Um, it can be things like praise, it can be um, rewards, it can be consequences, it can be routine, it can be birthdays, it can be Christmas, it can be occasions, it can be um, siblings' behaviour, it can be parents' relationships. They just find everything in life to be a pretty intense demand. So they spend a lot of energy um, trying not to comply with those. Um, yep, you guys can read. So I, I'm not into reading slides because I know you can read them quicker than I can. Um, they may become very easily upset or angered. So it's that tricky thing, isn't it? Because what I find is quite often until things get really quite bad and their anxiety becomes clinical, school and professionals don't believe you that there's anything wrong because they can put on a mask of being a perfect student and they can put on a mask of being a perfect client and they can put on the mask of being a perfect patient. So you go to the doctor, you go to the paediatrician, you go to the psychologist and they all look at you like you're a nutter. Um, and I have certainly experienced that myself and I've been with families who have experienced that and it's just absolutely demoralizing to know that the second you get them into the car they are going to lose it and they are going to lose it for hours and the pediatrician or the psychologist is never going to see that behavior it has to get to a very extreme point um, quite often um, when they're teenagers sometimes much earlier um, I've seen uh, grade four kids, grade three and four kids, unable to get out of bed and go to school due to the extreme anxiety and the demand avoidance that they experience. So they actually have difficulty telling the difference between real and pretend. I was talking to a young friend the other day and they, they have got self-appointed work that they have to do. Um, they are an amazing um, artist and they design and um, render OCs. So for those of you who don't know, OC stands for Original Characters and they're anime characters and you can actually go on to apps on your phone. Now, this young person... Ha believes it's her job to be creating these OCs. She has lots of rules around that. And she sees her self-imposed job as more important than going to school. It's more important than showering or getting dressed or being reasonable within her family. Her expectations on her family to support what she wants are just craziness. It's just nuts. Um, this poor young person hasn't been to school for two years. And look, there's no quick fixes to this and her parents are working tirelessly to support her. And slowly but surely, she's developing some skills. But it's really, really difficult. She truly believes that her self-imposed work is real and has to be done. Um, and to try and challenge that is just crazy. Um, a lot of them are desperate for friendships at school and can be very, very vulnerable to being manipulated if they can get to school. They are incredibly vulnerable in line. Um, I'm just going to be really blunt with you guys. They're incredibly vulnerable to being groomed and to being attacked and manipulated and abused online. Often they can be quite secretive about what's happening online and they're very, very clever because they do often spend a lot of time online. They can actually um, get around firewalls and things that you might put in place. Um, we often see 
um, meltdowns within a family when they feel like their siblings are doing things they shouldn't do. Now, as a parent, we often know the reason why we might let something slide. So we might have a family rule in place and it might be, you know, Kerry's turn to do the dishes tonight or it might be Julianne's turn to do the dishes tonight. However, Kerry has got a headache and um, so she's actually spoken to parents about that and Julianne might absolutely lose it because Kerry should be doing those dishes and then have a really, really um, big meltdown about that. Um, Paul, I've just had an email come through. Can you just have a look at that? Um, somebody can't get in. It's um, Deb from Engage OT. Thanks. Sorry about that, guys. Just saw it pop up on my screen. And I don't know whether the email's come to me or gone to reception. So often they don't see any difference between their level of authority in the world or their level of personal power within the world between them and teachers, the police, even parents. And they find it very hard to understand that there's any hierarchy within a family and that there's any difference in rights at all. Yeah, they have great difficulty taking responsibility you're not really ever going to get them to be able to own their own behaviour and to try and get them to do that is another demand. So what often happens is they may do something once. So you might say, I'd like you to apologise to your mother for the way that you spoke to her. And then we'll go, they'll go, mm, sorry. And we'll go, okay, great job. Thanks for that. That was awesome. Then the next time they speak, you know, disrespectfully, I'd like you to apologise to your mother, thank you. And they just go, no, nah, not, not doing it. And so what happens is they actually find a great deal of pressure when they do a task, they really find a lot of pressure around repeating the task because of the implied demand of our praise. And I'll talk some more about that later. They can, they appear incredibly rude and disrespectful, and that is often misunderstood. One of the things that really happens for these guys is that um, we know they can do things, right? So we know they actually have an ability to do things. So one day they might get up, get out of bed, get dressed, um, clean their teeth, brush their hair, make their bed, pack their bag and be ready for school totally independently. Now, I know you would probably all faint if that happened, but it, 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 it could possibly happen once. Um, and, and so you know that they can do it. You know they actually have the skills to do that. They have the ability to actually do those tasks. However, what is variable is their capacity to access the ability. Their capacity is variable. That ability never ever changes. That's always there. They can always do it, but they actually don't have the emotional capacity to access the skill that they have or the ability that they have. And there's so many things that impact that capacity. So the level of demands, what needs to be done, how they're feeling, did they sleep, have they got a sick stomach, are they feeling okay, can they actually work out what they're feeling, what's their interoceptive awareness like. Um, now just quickly a little side note, what's interoceptive awareness, thanks Karen, she's going yes you need to talk about that. So interoceptive awareness is the understanding of what's happening in our body so that we know how to change it. So an example of um, interoceptive awareness, I'll just go back and we'll talk about the eight senses. So we've got our five external senses that we're used to, our, our smell, our taste, our hearing, our sight and touch. So we're all across those and we totally understand them. 
Then we have three internal senses. So we have our vestibular sense, which is our balance, our proprioceptive sense. So that's if I say, put your hand up, you can just do that without thinking about it and knowing where your body is in space and time. And then you're, there's your interoceptive awareness. So your all your interoceptive sense. So that's knowing what's happening in your body. So you've got a feeling in your tummy. Are you hungry, thirsty, tired, sick? Do you need to do a wee? Do you need to do a poo? Are you anxious? What's actually happening in your stomach? And so when you can identify what that is, then you can do something about it. But if you can't work out what that is, you're just going to feel distressed and anxious. Another really good example is, I don't know if you've ever seen kids who hold on to their pen for grim death and they press really, really, really hard and then they become really discouraged writers and it's really hard to get them to write. What it is, is that they don't have interoceptive awareness of their hand or the muscles in their arms and they can't understand that they're holding it too tight and that if they eased off and didn't hold it so tight and didn't press so hard, that that pain would stop. They actually don't have the interoceptive awareness to understand that that's pain. So until we've developed that interoceptive awareness and know what's happening in our body, we can't actually do anything to change our state of being. Um, and that's a really big issue for these kids with PDA. So if they're having all sorts of um, issues internally, like lots and lots of kids with PDA have amazing gut issues. They have food intolerances and sensitivities. Um, as we know, lots of kids on the autism spectrum can be either celiac or gluten intolerant, cecilates, uh, oh, I can't get it to come out, um, amines and cecilates. Um, they're sensitive to all of these things and that impacts their capacity to access their ability. Um, if they know there's a birthday coming up, Christmas coming up, that there's work that they haven't done at school. Um, I know one young person who would like to have a try at going back to school, but they're so embarrassed that they've missed so much school and they're going to be so far behind the, the, that space inside their head about actually being able to do that process is just too much for them. And then that anxiety actually takes all of their emotional capacity all of the time. So they're not actually able to access their ability. Now, when anxiety gets as big as that, we actually need to possibly look at some pharmacological support and work with a paediatrician or a psychiatrist about bringing that overall state of anxiety down to something manageable. So like, I'm only talking like, if this is their capacity and it's full, like just increasing their capacity a tiny bit so that they can have some sense of mastery over what's going on because they become so overwhelmed. It's just crazy for them. What else is here? Oh, they don't seem to care and nothing could be further from the truth. They're terrified. They, they know that what they're, doing, what they're doing is not okay, but they don't know what to do about it and they're really, really scared. Um, so if we can come from a place of understanding that they're terrified, that can be really, really helpful. Okay, they don't understand themselves well. So often they have either a real or perceived sense that they don't have the skills that they need to do their everyday well. They just don't know how to do things. They don't know how to behave at school. They don't know how to behave at home. They don't know how to behave socially. They're so anxious about following the rules. They say things that are totally inappropriate. And then what happens is they start to get sanctioned by their peers and they don't understand that because often that sanctioning 
is not an overt bullying, but it's more a looking away or a turning away or they don't actually understand the hidden curriculum of the playground. So they don't understand if there's a whole heap of kids huddled together doing something, that that's a closed group. So they're likely to barge in and go, oh, you know, Ben 10 last night, and go off on their special interest and the other kids were actually all talking about power rangers it's really not going to go down well so the kids see them coming and then they close their groups and that is um, a form of sanctioning but they don't understand it because the other kids at school know they're a bit different and they just do but they don't actually understand it and they don't know what to do about it because they're not explicitly taught the skills that they need to be fully inclusive within the space. So that's a real issue to be worked on and that's something we might be able to talk about another time. Sorry, I'm gonna go off on lots of little tangents. It's really good that Alicia's done these amazing PowerPoints for me to help keep me on track. I'm a bit of a divergent thinker. Um, oh, Karen's smiling at me. Um, so divergent and convergent, this is something that's really helpful to understand. So if you're a convergent thinker, for example, if I said to you, think of a red ball. If you're a convergent thinker, all of your thoughts hone in onto the red ball. And you go, okay, oh, what shade of red is it? Is it light red, bright red, fluoro red? Um, what kind of ball is it? Is it a tennis ball? Is it a big ball, a small ball? What's the ball used for? So all of your thoughts converge to the ball. Now, with a divergent thinker, they go, oh, red ball. Oh, yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I had a red ball and we lived in North Road in Warrigal and the Honickers lived next door and I remember the ball went over the fence and they had a little dog called Scruffy. And, oh, that's right, we had a dog called Bandit on the farm and he used to go and um, chase the sheep and the potty calves were next to that and we used to feed the potty calves. So I have gone from a red ball to feeding potty calves on the farm in Jindavik. Um, in, in three steps, and I'm supposed to be thinking about a red ball. It's not wrong, it's just the way that I think. And if we have got a child with PDA, and they're a divergent thinker, they're gonna think about all of the different things that can go wrong, and they'll jump all over the place. If they're a convergent thinker, they will then converge on one thing that can go wrong and they will become obsessed about that thing. It's just helpful to support them to be able to have some thinking flexibility there. If you can explain different ways of thinking, that can be really supportive. And then if you can actually be explaining those things yourself and saying, oh, I'm such a divergent thinker. Gosh, when I go in, I'm um, doing the housework, I go into the bedroom and I go, right, I'm going to strip the sheets and I pull the dunes down, start stripping the sheets and I look over and there's a photo of my sister. Oh my goodness, I haven't rung Naomi for ages. I'll just go and ring Naomi. I'll head off to ring Naomi and then I'll see the dishes haven't been put in the dishwasher yet. So I think, oh yeah, I'll just put some dishes in the dishwasher and I see the ice cream bowls from last night and go, oh, that's right. We've run out of ice cream. I'll just go and write that on the fridge door. And, you know, cause we all have, you know, post-it notes all over the fridge. And then we get there and we see a post-it note that says, uh, call um, the pediatric clinic for an appointment with Mark. And so then we go to get our phone to um, ring and make an appointment with Mark. And by then it's actually time to go and get the kids from school and the bed's still half stripped, the dishwasher isn't loaded and nothing has actually got done. So that is an unmanaged divergent thinker. And I, I wouldn't know that from personal experience at all. Hmm. Now just ask Pete, he'll tell you. All right, it's frightening and stressful to have PDA. It's absolutely terrifying for them. They spend their lives like in terror all of the time. They actually experience going into situations as if they're life threatening. So going to school, 
they can actually believe that that threatens their life. And then they experience the people, us, the people who are supposed to keep them safe, we are pushing them into situations that terrify them. And unfortunately, they end up with post-traumatic stress type behaviours and responses to everyday activities. So if I was forced every day to go into a situation where I feared for my life, real or perceived, it doesn't matter, so their perception is their reality, I'm not going to want to get out of bed either. I'm not going to want to get any reward. There's no reward you could offer me that would be enough to get me to go into that situation where I feel threatened for my life. They just will not do it. All right, so supports. It's really important to try and understand why a child behaves they do. This actually helps you to expand emotionally to tolerate their really difficult, revolting behaviour. You're the person that is trying to support them and it feels like you're the person that wears it all. You're the person that they're violent to, aggressive to, swear at, um, throw things at, punch holes in walls, damage property. I know I'm talking about the extreme stuff, but I actually believe a lot of you really experience this extreme stuff and just don't know what to do next. Um, making their lives a bit easier makes your life a bit easier too. And stepping back and just taking a moment can be really helpful. I've got one young man that I've been working with for seven years. He spent five years in his bedroom and would not come out. So I started off going and sitting outside his bedroom door and um, listening to him play Call of Duty. Um, and then he let me come in and watch him play Call of Duty for a while. And I was trying not to talk because I knew that was a demand on him. So me talking to him in my counsel way that I can't help was he was experiencing that as a demand. I was trying really hard not to require responses from him, but I couldn't help myself. I'd, I'd say, so why, why are you doing that? And what's that thing for? And he experienced that as a demand. So in the end, I wasn't even allowed to go into his room and actually watch him play that. So I sat outside his door once a week, um, not speaking, just, you know, hey there, I'm here. That didn't work. So then I started taking him um, a Macca's coffee every week for two years. And I would just leave it in the kitchen for him. I didn't go to his door. Um, I didn't try and engage with him. I just supported his mum. And then one day, just out of the blue, he came out and said, I need help. I need help to have a conversation. I need help to learn, I need help to get a job, and I want to be able to drive. So slowly in the last two years, he now is, um, he's had some speech therapy, so he's learned how to do some reciprocal conversation. He um, is learning to do some self-care. He's working in um, supported um, employment three days a week, and he's having specialist driver training. Now, he is one of my most amazing success stories, but it's taken, you know, seven years of intensive therapy and supporting his family in an outside the box kind of way that didn't tick any boxes for outcomes for a really, really long time to see that progression happen. The reason I'm telling you that is because there's hope. There's a lot of hope for these kids and they can go on to have full and meaningful lives and you can go on to have really meaningful relationships with them. All right, I want to talk about praise, the implied demand. Because praise, I think, is the thing that puts most pressure on these kids and it's the thing that you can change most quickly. 
Now, we are indoctrinated to praise our kids. Like it is drummed into us. <gasps> good boy, yeah, good talking. And we, we praise them right from when they're really little. But these kids find that praise to be a demand. So let's have a look at this. Well, I talked a little bit, bit about it before. So you ask your child to say sorry. They manage their anxiety and they comply. You're thrilled. You praise the child, say, good job. Oh, that's so good. That helps your mum feel so much better when you say you're sorry for speaking to her. her really, really nastily. Like that just does so much for our family and it models appropriately to your little brothers and sisters and just does so much to repair relationships. We're so desperate for them to actually do anything good. We're going to pile it on. And then they have a meltdown. I've just thought of something I want to talk about in a minute, so I've written it down. Um, we pile it on and then they freeze or they explode. And then we've got to take ages and ages and ages to settle them. Now, then the next day, next time comes along, you make that request again. Can you apologise to your mum for the way you spoke to her? Then they erupt. They refuse to perform the task. Then you start reminding and re-requesting. Um, you, you go through the its successes and how much it helped. And then they melt down, they shut down, they refuse to comply. Then we as parents go into the, the bribe, cajole, um, you know, bribery, corruption and manipulation um, pathway that we go down. Um, kid melts down. Often if it's in a public place, you won't get the meltdown until you get home. They'll smile sweetly and be totally passive aggressive. Um, and then they'll refuse to do the activity again. We often see this with um, kids who are doing school refusal. Okay, so they'll refuse to go to school, refuse to go to school, and we'll do all these modified programs and We'll do all sorts of things for them. Oh, you only have to go half days. Oh, you only have to go one day a week. You only have to go one hour a week. If you actually get in the car and drive to the school, we're happy. Um, if you actually get out of bed, we're happy. Do you know what I mean? We, we keep, we bring it back and we bring it back. But what happens is as soon as they do one step, supposing that they actually get to school one day, they actually pull themselves together enough on the inside to get to school on one day. School's excited, their friends are excited. Um, they might even look like they're having a great day. Um, they might join in, they might be engaging with their friends at lunchtime, the whole nine yards. Everybody's really thrilled. Phone calls, oh, Bobby had a great day at school today. It was so good to see her. You've done such a great job as a mum getting her to school. So then you actually feel the demand as well. Um, they get home, um, they either melt down or they go to bed and then they don't get actually up out of bed again for three months to two years. Because the praise is an implied demand that they repeat and that if they can do it once, they can do it again. However, they know that they can't necessarily do it again. Uh, it can be even little things like um, eating or using a knife and fork or toilet training so if kids have got pda early um, and they're really demand avoidant it can be a really big issue with toilet training because you know when they go to the toilet yay big party big party um and then they don't they might actually have a genuine accident and then they feel that pressure because they haven't been able to maintain what you're requiring them to do so that implied demand can just be incredibly, incredibly wearing on them and incredibly wearing on you. All right. Now, I find that one of the best places to get up-to-date research and information around PDA is the PDA Society in the UK. They have amazing resources, and I'm, I'm sure probably most of you know that, but some of you won't, so just write that down. And they have a process called PANDA, which can be really, really helpful. I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail tonight, um, but 
if enough of you request that we go through the whole PENDA process, we might look at that for um, our November talk. And then in December, I want to talk about managing um, Christmas, uh, family visitors, how to set up for that, um, how to not have crazy meltdowns, how to set reasonable expectations, how to survive the school holidays. Then um, we'll probably do something in the middle of January about getting them back to school. So Karen, how are you going with collating some questions there for us? Yeah, there's some great questions, Bobby. What a great night. Thank you so much for this information. Um, a lot of people are just saying you, they feel like you've got a cabra in their house that, that you're explaining their situation. And um, so we've got a, a couple of questions. Um, is PDA the same as ODD? Mm -hmm. Amy asked, um, after food intolerance, you said something about solicitates and she solicitates solicitates was the word i was trying to get out amines and solicitates um and i would say the best website to look at around that kind of thing is um sue dengate's fed up website she's got the best information i've ever seen um and look she has this thing called magic cordial now it sounds crazy um you know, if kids go to a birthday party and they have too much sugar and too much food colouring, they, they can become quite dysregulated and just feel really cool. Um, Magic Cordial, which is a combination, I think, of sugar, citric acid and bicarb. I can't remember exactly. Um, and you make it up um, and it's quite a um, condensed, reduced kind of syrup and you use it as a cordial and that actually helps set things to right in their body. And she talks all about how to do that. Now, um, she, her website is amazing and she has so much information on there. But if you're concerned that your kids might have issues with amine, salicylates, gluten, um, anything that they might be intolerant to, that's the place to go. Um, and someone's kindly put it up on our chat the links so that is so great thank um, you so much yeah really good um and there's just been comments about how hard it is to put your kids on medication and what a hard decision that is um and lots of talk about how kids will be okay at school and then come home and just explode and um professionals not understanding teachers psychologists blaming the parents um yeah making a really difficult situation even harder and so heartbreaking. Uh, it really is. Um, I'm going to tell you about why I do what I do. My um, youngest son had, um, he, he had lots of behaviour issues as a child, like really big behaviour issues. And he was diagnosed with ADHD really early, um, probably at about three. And I refused to do the medication thing. Absolutely flatly refused. I did everything. I did homeopathy. I did kinesiology. I did OT, physio, speech. Um, we did yoga. Um, I just went everywhere. He had counselling and he could counsel a counsellor, um, the whole nine yards. Um, and then finally, when he was 10, um, just in absolute desperation, I went to um, a paediatrician bawling my eyes out. And he said, do you know what, Bobby? It's actually getting to the point where I am just about calling child protection because I have recommended medication for your child. You are distressed. Your child is distressed. Everything is getting much worse and you're not accepting advice. You're not acting protectively and you're not actually taking the help that is being offered for your child. It was a, like the biggest bucket of icy cold water over me. Like it really gave me a very big shaker. So I acquiesced and I did a Ritalin trial. And, you know, I'm talking like 24 years ago. 
here, like a long time ago. Um, and do you know what? Within an hour, I was devastated, but not for the reason that you would think. He was settled. He could concentrate and he sat down and played with his Lego like he'd never played with Lego before. I was devastated because I really felt I had failed as a parent. Often we think um, putting our kids on medication is done and dusted. Like once I start, we can't stop. Nothing could be further than the truth, um, further from the truth. A trial is sometimes a really good idea. You, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least you've tried that. And if it does work, Great. Now, my son ended up in jail at 13. Okay, that's what happened. It, it, the horse had bolted by 10. Starting medication at 10 for him was too late. Now, there were two things at play there. I, he was being treated for ADHD and I was using recognised ADHD strategies, but they weren't working. It wasn't until he got out of jail and was 16 that we got that formalised diagnosis of autism. We had been putting the cart before the horse. We, we needed the diagnosis of autism first. Yes, he absolutely had ADHD and he required that medication, but he had sensory issues. He was obsessive. It was horrific. I just, I, you know, you know how bad it was. I don't need to tell you how dreadful it was. It was really bad. And I felt like the worst failure as a mother. Here I was trying to do the right thing for him and he ended up in jail. I know that's worst case scenario, but it does happen. So the reason I do what I do now is because I want people to have the information that they need. I want them to know what I didn't know. I want to be the therapist and the information giver that I didn't have. I just needed somebody to go, okay, Bobby, now the next thing you need to do is you need to go and have a blood test and then come back to me. Check for iron, have a celiac test done and do this and then come back. Okay, Bobby, now... So he's come back. He's not quite celiacs, but there's something going on there. So let's, let's look at cutting out gluten and we'll see if that helps and see if that's what's going on. Yeah, good. That's helped a little bit. All right. Now, the next thing to do is to get your referral to a paediatrician and just step through that process. What I do is not rocket science. It's just understanding the processes that happen. And then there's been a whole nother layer come on top of the NDIS, um, which can just be the most crazy source of grief and distress for us all. Now, I would say I've got a pretty good handle on the NDIS. I'm a registered NDIS service provider. I've been through an audit, whole nine yards. But do you know what? I actually had to appeal twice and move our case from our local area office to out of town to actually get my grandson who I'm raising, so my son's son that I'm raising, to actually get the support that we need. It's not an easy gig and we're tired, we're exhausted. We're trying to manage working, we're trying to manage a household, we're trying to manage other kids. Um, some of us here are kinship carers. We're trying to manage our relationships with our other kids and our other grandchildren as well. It gets really, really complicated. Yeah. Yes. Bob, uh, Bobby, just thanks so much for your vulnerability there. And, you know, I've had the privilege of watching you sit with families and just walk with them step by step. And I think everyone can hear tonight just where your heart's at and, and why you're motivated the way you're motivated. So um, it just comes from a place of understanding. We've yeah. got a couple of other great questions. Yep. Um, so we've got one that, how do you get your child, 14 years old, to see a specialist and to acknowledge that they need help and medication when they refuse? Mm. It's tricky. And I just want to give you the other couple just so that we can get through them. Yeah. Um, 
from Cindy. She's asking, are these children and adults susceptible to su suicide ideation? Yeah, because they get so desperate. And because they're so scared all the time and they're terrified and they feel like failures, absolutely they are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just the other one is, how is PDA different or distinct from other forms of ASD? Yeah. Um, that, that is a really, really, really good question. So um, I'll go back to the 14-year-old. But I'll, I'll answer that one first. So don't let me forget, I want to go back to the 14-year-old because that's a really, really important question. Okay, so PDA, um, they're great at role play. They um, can manage social situations on the outside. Um, they can do eye contact quite well because they do a role play. So they role play being a good patient and saying the right thing at the paediatrician. So often they'll go into the paediatrician and the paediatrician will say, hello, Bobby, how are you today? Hello, Dr. Mark, I am very well, thank you. And they will follow a script that they have learned and then Dr. Mark will turn to, to um, mum and say, I really don't think there's an issue here. No, I'm not seeing any autistic behaviours. Mm, no, I can't see any obsessions. And this is where we as parents, like with the 14-year-old, we that they don't see an issue because they can go to the doctor and they can do the right thing. The doctor doesn't see an issue because they go to the doctor and do the right thing. I think it's um, really hard to... Um, get people to understand. I think that's, that's one of the hardest things. Um, there is um, an amazing PDA um, Facebook page. Um, it's a closed page. Now, I deliberately haven't joined that page because I think that's a really important page for parents. Um, and I would encourage you, if you haven't joined that, PDA Australia, go there. Um, Sometimes us professionals don't know all the things that we think we might know. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, a young woman again and her current obsession is um, needing McDonald's all of the time. And they live rural. So, you know, she wants McDonald's all of the time. She'll become obsessed about McDonald's. She will trash the house. She will hurt her mum. Uh, she'll drive her sibling crazy. Um, just obsessed about McDonald's, 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 McDonald's. She knows that McDonald's is open 24-7. And so we've been trying all sorts of different strategies and mum got on the PDA um, support page and somebody there suggested put her off a bit and make her eat something at home before you'll go to McDonald's. So you must have some avocado on toast before we go to McDonald's. Because possibly what it is, the child is so hungry that they're becoming obsessed and, and they're panicking because they're feeling that overwhelming hunger. So this was an amazing strategy that came from the PDA page was give them something to eat first, that delays them. Then they're actually their blood sugar comes up because they've actually eaten something. They're no longer feeling starving and they can be more in their right mind. So rather than being back in their um, hippocampus at the back and freaking out and their amygdala going crazy, alerting them and saying, oh, my goodness, you're going to die, that all settles down because they get the message, oh, we're not dying. Our blood sugar is settled. So then we can put a strategy in place. Um, so, sorry, um, divergent thinking again. There's some great questions, isn't there? And I'm just conscious of the fact that we've got four, four minutes. Yeah. All right, the 14-year-old. Uh, I wish I had an easy answer, but I really don't. I think um, 
It's about finding an advocate for yourself um, and a professional that actually understands PDA really, really well. Finding somebody locally is ideal if you can, but if you can't, find somebody remote that can zoom in and start having that person zooming in and just talking to you um, so that they get used to the sound of that person's voice within your house and that you start talking about that therapist as being part of your family team and supporting your family. Reduce the demand on them to go to the doctor or do anything and work with the therapist to address every other issue that you've got in your family and supporting you to be the best that you can be. As they hear that process happening within your home, they're more likely to be able to get to a place where they actually happen to be walking by one day and just walk through the background. Now, I'm really sorry, it is not going to be quick. It's possibly going to take a long time. Um, if it's really, really, really bad, there's other things that can happen. So if they're being violent, you can call an ambulance and you can call the police. Now, I know these are extreme things that we just don't want to do, um, but if they're really at serious risk to themselves, sometimes we actually have to escalate the situation enough for emergency services to get involved and even, God forbid, a child protection referral to be done, um, which is just the most terrifying thing in the world. Um, I've had child protection referrals done on me um, as a parent and also as a kinship carer grandparent. And I have made child protection referrals and there's no fun way about it. But what it does, especially now that we've got Orange Door, there's a lot more support available. The other thing I wanna talk about is the Carers Gateway, um, which is a federally funded program now um, that funds support for carers. It doesn't pay for any support for your child, but it pays for support for you. Even if you've got the NDIS, you can access carer support through Carer Gateway. If you don't have NDIS because your child hasn't got a formal diagnosis yet, they actually have a big bucket of support that they can give you to support you on that journey towards diagnosis. I know the other day Carers Gateway funded a carer for three months to actually go in and build a relationship with a young person. So a couple of hours a week for three months, they funded that support um, just to reduce some of the stress and pressure on mum so that she can actually um, get some support for herself. Um, I don't know if you've actually noticed, but these kids can hear anything from anywhere in the house and you're trying to have a private conversation with the therapist in your bedroom or with anybody in your bedroom or outside, they're going to come and find you. They hear everything. So you actually can't even do your own process. You can't say how exhausted or stressed or how you're hating their guts today or you wish you weren't a parent or you wish you didn't have them or you wish you could send them back to where they came from or I don't know how I can keep doing this and I'm actually feeling suicidal myself. There is no space to have those conversations. So Care a Gateway will make a way for you to be able to have those conversations and get that support yourself. And they're building a huge network of therapists, mostly counsellors and psychotherapists around the place for you to be able to access. Um, and if there's nobody in your area, um, because of our current situation, you can be referred wherever you need to go. Any more questions we've got like, oh, we've gone over by a minute. Yeah, there's lots of questions. And I'm just wondering, I think we were going to save the chat and whether yes. we address all of those because they each need probably about a five minute explanation each, at least. All right. Okay. So how about what we do is we'll absolutely save the chat. On the first Thursday night of November, we'll advertise another webinar 
we'll put it on. I will have gone through and got all of your questions. I'll put them on PowerPoints and I'll have dot point answers to them. We'll group them all together and we'll have a really practical time of what to do about these things. How does that sound, guys? Yeah, good. Good. All right. Great Look, evening. Great evening. Yeah, great information. I forgot about that. So um, we have our Facebook page that you're welcome to frequent. I probably put up one to two parent tips a week. Um, just a video of me standing in my room here going, oh, now I just want to talk about capacity versus ability or remember about the impact of um, implied demands. It's just a little 30 second to a minute little grab. Um, and I might even be able to start answering some of your questions in that space as well. Um, don't forget to request a certificate if you'd like one. It doesn't have to be for work. If, it's, if you would just like to have it for you, a certificate to say that you attended tonight, you are really welcome to have that. Um, feel free to contact us if you need anything or if we can help point you in the right direction. Our website has got um, a few different options on there for you. Uh, we do offer a single session and a three session um, program that you're able to access with us. We are not in a place where we can take on a whole lot of new clients. But what we can do is we can do a single session with you and we can point you in the right direction and say, okay, go and do this, this, this and this and off you go and you do those things and you can make another single session in a few months. Or if you're having a lot of trouble, say with your NDIS plan or something like that, we can do a three session intensive with you and provide you with a report at the end. But all the details about that are on the website. The main thing is I don't want you to experience any of that information as a demand you will be welcome to come back to our webinars every month for the next 10 years and never make contact with us except for to get your link. We're gonna put it on try booking or something like that next time. So you can just log in, you'll get your link and all that sort of stuff and your email reminders. We'll do it better next time. But um, Karen, thank you so much for supporting me tonight. Thank you so much everybody for coming. Please go gently, one step at a time, and just try to really not praise. Try to be really circumspect when they do things. Often we praise them for things that they just should be able to do, like get out of bed. That doesn't require praise. That's just, oh, yeah, okay, because that reduces the demand on them. And then they can actually get out of bed the next day because they know you don't expect them to do it every day. So if they can manage it three days in a row, it's just like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And if they can't get out of bed on the fourth day because they're totally exhausted, oh, yeah. So it's about managing to get yourself responding the same way regardless of what they're doing because that provides co-regulation. And here I go again, Karen, off on another divergent track. Important tracks, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned the intensives. I've seen people's lives change through those. Um, yeah, but there's no pressure. No pressure whatsoever. Uh, we're just so glad that people have come tonight. We're, it's really um, blessed us both, the whole team, actually, to see the response. And so, yeah, and just I'm um, looking at all the thank yous, Bobby, and just people are really, um, well, they're, they're seeing a mirror, really. They're hearing the information and it feels like a mirror. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thanks for coming.